How to write a report for a project. Welcome to Monitoring and Evaluation Made Simple. I'm your host, Coach Alexander. I'm so glad that you've joined me today because we're going to be looking at this topic in particular. And the reason why I felt we should look at this topic is because I do receive a lot of queries. Okay, like I earlier mentioned, I do receive emails of people asking me a lot of things, especially to do with M&D and project management. But before I go any further, if you are here for the very first time, welcome to the M&D Made Simple channel. I've been doing monitoring and evaluation for 10 years now, so I want you to be my friend. I want you to subscribe to this channel if you haven't done so yet, because on a regular basis, I post updates in relation to monitoring and evaluation and also project management. There are these free ebooks, okay? So the link is in the description below. Please download these ebooks. If you can't download them, please write to me. I'll be happy to share you these ebooks because they are very important. They give you a guide on how you can do M and E in your organizations. And also, I have this course which is uh, being hosted on Udemy called "How to Write an Effective Research Paper." Please, guys, take some time to enroll in this course because it actually shows you how you can do research the right way. And you know that in monitoring and evaluation, there are components of research. So this is something I would encourage many of my friends, many of my subscribers to try and enroll in this course. Okay, so these are, as you can see, this is the course outline for that particular Udemy, how to, how to write a research paper. So this video is quite long. I thought of making it uh, long because I wanted to be so much elaborate on these issues to do with report writing. So please guys, if you have a pen and paper, take some notes and if you have any questions, please write to me. But the timestamps are there just to make your experience better so that if you don't have the time to watch the whole video, you can just uh, click to the point of this video which interests you. Interests you. So that's the outline. And based on this outline, this is those are the topics we'll be talking about today. What is a project? The review of the project and reflection on the objectives and uh, so on and so forth. So basically, I'm just showcasing to you the steps of writing a project report. But there has to be some kind of background before we go into the nitty gritties. OK, so if you don't mind, let's get started, shall we? So now, what is a project? So now the project, guys, is interesting because uh, you see this, these projects all around us. If you go into the cities, okay, let's say you're coming, you're in a country where there's a lot of uh, construction works happening, could be road constru construction works, could be housing construction works. Those are projects in itself, okay? And... The interesting thing is that a project is, uh, it has been designed to achieve certain objectives, okay? And as you can see there, it mentions those objectives in terms of the outputs, the outcomes, or benefits. So let's say you're constructing a road. The issue is that there's some kind of long-term benefit that should come out of that road, okay? There should be short-term and long-term benefits. The short-term benefit is that you have a road and it will make transportation easier and uh, cheaper. But the long-term benefit could be that that road is going to make it easier for uh, transportation of goods, okay, and those transportation of goods will stimulate economic activity such that people pe perhaps will have uh, more shops along that road and there will probably be other enjoyable benefits because you have that road in place. 
So that's what a project aims to do. But it, a project also, you need to understand, it has a, a budget and also an agreed time frame in which to complete these activities. So I talked about the project in terms of the housing construction projects, the road construction projects, but there are also projects that we are more familiar with, the developmental projects that have to do with poverty reduction, improved livelihoods, okay? The, the projects you see a lot of humanitarian organizations implementing around the world. So there are different kinds of projects. As you can see in the images I've presented to you, you can see an engineer representing the construction projects. Then you can also see the doctor presenting, representing the healthcare projects. And as well as uh, the sh you can see, I, I put the ship there that represents the, the agriculture projects, but there are so many different projects that we can talk about. So now the, the issue is, before you start writing your report, a project, because you know that, and in most cases, when you're coming up with these reports, you probably have a key position in your organization. It could be a project coordinator, project officer, and the demand is high from your stakeholders to see how well the project is doing. So the first thing you need to do is reflect on the project objectives and review the project, okay? That is the very first thing that you do. So every project has its objectives, okay? There is no project I have seen in my over 10 years of work. There is no project that I have seen that doesn't have some set objectives and goals. And we need to be clear on this because it really guides on how you are going to formulate your report, what you are going to communicate. So it all begins by understanding your objectives Okay, and these objectives really, I like to look at them as the short-term endeavors. But when you look at the goals of a project, these are the long-term endeavors or undertakings that you would want to see. Now, I know that not all projects use the logical framework, and I hope the image is visible, though it's, I know it's a bit blurry. But if you have access to books, there are a lot of materials actually online. You can, you can Google logical framework and actually there are some videos on this channel that talk about the logical framework. Every project must have this kind of a framework. And I believe even the, these construction projects you see all around us, I'm not sure whether they use these kind of tools, but these are very important tools because it gives you that sequence. It gives you exactly what you are measuring. So as you can see in this log frame, it builds from the activities all the way up to the goals. So before or actually in your reflection exercise, as you are reflecting, you're going to go back to the document that gives you this diagram, okay? If there's no diagram of this kind of nature, you being an expert should be able to come up with some kind of rough idea of the sequence, because that is what is critical in every project. What is the sequence? Why are we doing these activities? What do these activities translate to? So like in this particular case, if you look at the activities, you can say that you can see that these activities down here translate to the outputs here, which translates to an overall outcome and an overall goal. Okay, so there should be that sequence. You should understand it. You should understand what are you measuring? Okay, and once you understand those issues, 
it will be so much easier for you to come up with this report that stakeholders are going to accept. So if you want to learn more about the logical framework uh, analysis, I, I hope I won't forget, but I'll put a link in the description below, or you can simply go to the YouTube search bar and type logical framework analysis. There's a lot of videos out there on the log frame, including on this channel, there is a, something talking about the logical framework analysis. Now, there is a standard format for effective report writing. And we all know this standard, all right? The thing is that whenever you're coming up with a report, most reports out there, except that, okay, organizations like to have their own style of doing things, but it's usually universal. You must have a cover page, okay? That cover page must explain what the report is about, okay? Project report or project quarterly report on activities that have been implemented from January to March. It could be that, or it could be an annual report. That should be your cover page. Then you, you, you get into the next part of the document, which is the table of contents. After the table, now usually, I, I, what usually happens actually, is that before you come up with the table of contents, you already, you already need to populate information in the introduction section, the objective section, the methodology section, the finding session, uh, section, sorry, the conclusion and recommendations. Okay. So now the introduction, as we know what it means, I'm pretty sure you know what it means. It's you're yeah, simply just uh, giving the reader what this report is about, okay? Then the objectives of the report, the methodology. So now the, what is really key are the findings, okay? The other sections are important, but what you really need to be focusing on now is really the findings, the conclusion, and the recommendations. Now, this is something I do and it has worked very well. And I always encourage even the people that I, I mentor and coach to follow suit in the same, uh, the same uh, way. When it comes to reporting on findings, focus on what you have achieved in relation to the objectives. Mention the results in relation to the goals, the outcomes, the outputs. Remember in that logical framework, there are those indicators. Report on the indicators. Now, if you don't have those indicators, report on how you have actually moved from one point to the other. What change has been achieved? And that is why it's easier for people to report when they have a baseline, okay? As you can see here, you need to establish a baseline so that as you are reporting on progress, you are able to measure the change that has been achieved from the baseline uh, stage to the next stage. It is important to outline your challenges. And the reason why that is key is because the, in most cases, when we set ourselves targets, we normally deviate from those targets. So now the question is, why have you deviated from the initial targets that you set for yourself? It's because of the challenges. 
So when you list those challenges, the readers, the stakeholders are going to understand why you failed to fulfill your goals. And it becomes easier to mitigate those challenges in the next implementation phase. And when you mention those challenges, in your recommendations, you can actually explain to the reader or your stakeholders how you think these challenges can be resolved. Let's say the challenge you face is lack of funding or, okay, maybe lack of funding is maybe too, okay, let's look for a better one. Let's say funding is not being received on time from the donor. So this lack of funding being received on time has an implication on the rate of implementation. So in your recommendations, you can state that we would want to urge the, our funders, if it is within their power, to release funds on time so that the implementation rate can be done on time. Now, how do you write your conclusion? The conclusion is the part of the report which details really what, yeah, okay, to just to say this, it just details your conclusion, what you found at the end of all your findings. What do these findings mean? You are simply drawing inferences from the entire report and processes. So when you are coming up with the conclusion, you want to ensure that you, you, you make it brief and straight to the point. You give the reader exactly, you know, they shouldn't, when they read the report, they shouldn't be left hanging after reading the conclusion. They shouldn't be left guessing. I've seen reports that don't give you the conclusion. They have a section in there, they have a section called conclusion, but they don't tell you whether they've achieved their objectives or not. They keep going in circles. It's really important for you to hit the nail on the head. So for example, if the objectives of your, of your project, let's say your objective was to build a three-story building. So now in your conclusion, you are going to state that the, the building, I mean the construction of a three-story building was achieved, okay? If it wasn't achieved, you mention in the conclusion, in conclusion, the construction of the building was not achieved. However, you explain further other aspects that the reader should take into account, okay? But don't be going in circles, but just summarize what your findings were. I want to come I want to mention something about t targets. And this is something I hold dear because target setting is really what defines and and draws the line between what we can achieve and what we don't we can't achieve. So now the the way we set our targets as an organization is very important because if we overstate a target, if it becomes too ambitious for us, we will be looked at as underperforming because we set the bar too high. So that is why it's usually good to come up with a target that is realistic and that you can work with. So now how do you do this? It all comes down to having a baseline. And based on the baseline, 
you can be able to focus and see what is achievable and also based on the past trends that you've seen okay so and when i say past trends you know over the years we do collect data and that data gives us some kind of trends okay and based on that past data you can be able to project how things can be in the future so the first step is to establish the baseline the second step is to use past trend data to forecast the future then step three is to involve experts and different stakeholders who are knowledgeable on the subject matter so what this really means is that if you you design a project and you say that you want to reduce poverty by five percent what does the past data trends tell you about reduction in poverty is it actually a realistic target to set is the five percent reduction realistic so you're going to set that target but then you have that target validated by the experts by those who are knowledgeable on these issues so now the recommendations the recommendations are actually what help build this the whole learning process and this is part and parcel of the m and d system which i always like to talk about now when these recommendations are formulated they are meant to improve on the weaknesses that have been identified now there's something i need to mention that the challenges that you identified should be linked to the recommendations so if you had five challenges it's most likely that you have five recommendations so it all comes down to you coming up with uh, these recommendations that are going to help improve the project now it is one thing to recommend but I can tell you it's another to actually implement these recommendations. Now, if you're, an, if you're a type of organization that does not like to walk the talk, you are going to find out that each implementation phase that you have will only end up in failure because you are not implementing uh, the improvement plans that have been uh, formulated by the people that have seen the challenges and what is hindering development. Now we know that in some cases, certain challenges are beyond your control, such as economic instability, political instability, and so on and so forth. But those challenges which you have control over should be resolved so that the implementation of the project can be better than it was perhaps five or 10 years ago. This is also another aspect which is extremely important. And I want to, talk, I want to touch this part of the presentation by mentioning that when it comes to report writing it does get kind of stressful especially when you have your bosses demanding for a report at a certain time so what I'm saying here is that you may be working under a very tight deadline. However, it is important to proofread your document before you actually submit it. You'll be surprised that 
there are learned people in this world who come up with a good report, but that report has a lot of grammatical errors and typos and it's not been well aligned. You'll be surprised that such things exist and it's simply because they didn't take the time to proofread. So proofreading is the last step in the writing process. So this in involves checking for errors and cleaning up your document. There are softwares you can use on the internet. You just go on Google, you can type and look for softwares that can help you eliminate some of these errors. But even Microsoft Word has the spelling check, which can help you uh, reduce grammatical errors, punctuations, and so on and so forth. However, I must mention that the, the writer of this document is should be well equipped actually to do this exercise by himself or herself. Because sometimes there are certain things that the computer can't correct, but it can only be corrected by the writer. Okay, so now I wanted to talk about the, this Udemy course, how to write an effective research paper. This is a very good course, guys. And I'll be releasing another video on how to write an effective research paper, but it's similar to this uh, video that I, I just talked about. This is really important because in the project implementation, they, there are components of research and research is important for all of us. This is the outline and it talks about introduction, overview, literature review, methodology, results, discussion, conclusion, references, and plagiarism. So that really marks the end of this long video. I sure hope you enjoyed every bit of it. If you have any questions, you can write to me, but especially on coaching and mentoring, in case you didn't know, I do this coaching and mentoring. So please write to me. I've been your host, Coach Alexander, and see